So today, <laughs> I'm talking about high impact, proper, um, impact opportunities for mobile free-to-play uh, games user research. And uh, I'm utilizing my background learnings from the Lean Startup and digital services. So I have been working on a mainstream user research for 13 years. And uh, my serious love to user research really started when I was coding and uh, realized how much uh, development time and effort can be saved by early phase user research. And then I stopped coding <laughs> and focused totally on the user research. And uh, then I started a digital service startup, co-founded it with some other people, and uh, learned a lot about the digital funnel, uh, lean startup thinking, and uh, product management. And then I found a really fun place called Rovio. <laughs> so now I'm there. At Rovio, we have a user research lab. But it's not a physical lab, it's a mental state. <laughs> so we have two central researchers, me and Lauri, who is sitting here in the front row. And uh, then we have three in-team researchers. And actually our mission and the mission of the whole company is to make uh, bigger, better and fewer games. And uh, like you see here, we have currently 20 games live. And we are serving five game studios in Stockholm, in Helsinki and in London. And um, we have a lot of um, different genres. We are all mobile. But we have, um, we have um, uh, traditional puzzle slingshot games like Angry Birds 2. And we have uh, mobile RPG like Angry Birds Evolution. We have um, a, a pure match 3 game, Angry Birds Match. And uh, then we have player versus player game called Battle Bay that is new IP. So today I'm talking about high impact opportunities. And what do I mean with that? I'm thinking how we user researchers can make more successful free to play games. Uh, and I have a specific angle here. So I'm taking, so, uh, taking learnings from the digital services, user research, lean startup and product management and I'm translating them into games user research. And this is something that we have been doing uh, Rovio during the last year. This is not everything we are doing in Rovio regarding user research. So this is just my special angle today. And uh, my topics today are change as an opportunity, analytics, user acquisition, and organic growth and retention. So now is the time for, for Paul Jim. Can you please raise your right hand if you are working on free to play games? Great, okay. And keep it, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. This is a gym, I call this a gym. So raise your left hand if you are using analytics. Great. And now raise your left foot. <laughs> OK, thank you. OK, so my first topic, change. When I came to Rovio, I realized that these free-to-play games are very similar to consumer software service products. We are trying to um, get as many people as possible to use the use the service or play the game and convert as big part of them as possible paying customers. Think of Spotify, for example. And uh, as we all know, uh, this free-to-play game business model has been a really big change for the industry. Um, but how has user research changed? So this is why I'm today trying to 
a little bit bring up a, a new perspective to this. So this is the first learning. Um, this is uh, maybe the biggest learning I got from the, from the startup time. So every change is an opportunity. Uh, it's an opportunity to learn something new. It maybe pushes you to places where you otherwise wouldn't be. So it also requires you to rethink a little bit because you have to change your plans. And if you have to change your plans and rethink, why not try to also make it bigger and better? Uh, for example, we had a game in soft launch and they were doing a lot of A-B testing, doing surveys. And me and my team thought that, okay, it would be very good to do qualitative study for them, to do a five-person interview study or something, because they had been in soft launch for a very long time, and they needed validation for their thoughts. And I went to the product manager and uh, made this suggestion very nicely, I thought, in a nice way, and the answer I got was no. It, it was this kind of a war, like, no. And uh, you rarely get that <laughs> in a working environment. But he really felt that there would be no, no uh, benefits from doing this kind of research for his, his product. And then I thought that, okay, uh, I have to change my plans because I, I thought this, this is the way forward, that we do this little study. So instead, I suggested them a focus group. So why don't you come with your team to look at these kind of focus groups? And uh, instead of interviewing five people, we ended up interviewing 18 people in three groups. And this was really successful, and they liked it. So I'm just saying, <laughs> thinking a little bit differently. So. What we want to get is to get from here, we are shouting, you need user research to your game. And uh, product manager saying, what is user research? My game is live, I can get uh, analytics data, I can do A-B testing. To here, product manager is saying, I need user research, I'm losing players and money unless I get user research. And I'm saying that, hey, <laughs> let's see well, if I have fun. <laughs> so go, uh -huh. sorry. Uh, so <clears throat> analytics is a really a treasure box also for us user researchers. <coughs> now that the games are alive, we can get a lot of analytics data from there, and I think we should really also utilize it for user research. So Andreas already did a talk about the analytics. I think you know this, but I keep a brief um, recap. So it's a statistical data about the player's game usage. And in free-to-play world, uh, we have these key performance indicators that are quite nice. Like we have the user base measure, we have the retention, meaning the um, repeating uh, that people are coming back, uh, D1, D3, D7, meaning like D0 is the first session, D1 is the first retention coming first time back the following day, I mean the next day, uh, and spending. And this really measures the success of the game. So if you can help game team to improve <coughs> these measures, you are really making an impactful research. And uh, typically also, I mean, in the analytics world, everything can be tracked if, if you put a lot of effort in it. So we also track uh, some events like uh, end of the level, making a purchase, etc. So here is just an example to illustrate what it is. So this is a so-called uh, funnel, and the red, <coughs> red, sorry, red color is the game, uh, game line, and the benchmark line is on gray. 
So what you see here is that 80% of the people um, start the game to the first session after the installation. And on D1, the number of people, that means the following day, only 40% come back. And if you look at the D14 at the end, 20% uh, come back. So that's what it, why it's called a funnel, like it's, uh, you want to get people to come back and that's really a big issue and the motivation and what we are always trying to do is to get these figures higher and higher. Uh, so first learning here is that um, we can use analytics to identify and discuss problems worth researching. So a game team <coughs> might not be uh, able to tell that, oh, we have this kind of uh, usability problem or any kind of problem in the user experience, but they are always able to say how they are doing in terms of their KPIs. What are the problems there? So they can compare to the benchmark, they can compare to the similar products. And uh, this really gives you a starting point for discussion and it's much easier to also for the team to come up and say, hey, we have a D1 retention is lower than should be. Is there something we can do together than uh, defining it in some other way. So they can be very specific about the problem. And we have then the same language and same goals. So that's why I'm saying that user researchers working on free to play, working on this kind of thing, should really know the language of KPIs. Okay, next learning. Uh, you can search clues for the, to focus on the research and to make hypotheses from the analytics. So before going to uh, planning the study, it's good to go to the business analyst or um, product manager to talk about the analytics figures and look through them together. And this is my checklist of the things I look from here. For example, it's, it's, a, it's a question of a retention problem. So amount of sessions, that's not a problem in the, in the gaming industry. They are really good sample sizes there. But in the, okay. And, but then I'm looking at the, whether the problem has um, appeared recently or whether it has persisted for the longer time. Looking at the cohorts like uh, October cohort or September players and the session length or minutes spent. So they might indicate something even before you see a drop in the retention, you might see that, hey, the sessions are, or minutes are diminishing much farther away. And there are other, other things also. One thing that is, has been really useful is, is looking at the success path. But the point is here that analytics, should, we should use it only as a tool to help us and not to fool or restrict us. And um, we still maintain our power of uh, being able to tell why. Being able to tell why things happen. So statistics rarely tell that. So do your user research magic. Um, saying that we only tell why is a little bit, I know, it's a, a simplification. But uh, really, if you can tell why to some of the analytics problems, I mean problems noticed in the analytics and the KPI figures, it's really impactful research and game teams and product managers will listen to you. So in these cases, we are using very traditional user research methods to find out this why. Uh, for example, with Angry Birds Match, uh, the KPIs look good but the team thought that the long-term retention was not so good. And uh, then we did a review and an interview study for our long-term players to find <coughs> out why, why long-term players were churning more than we, they should be. 
and uh, we did some churn related findings and one of the findings was that they were in the end of their content so they could play the events and there were three events per week and they liked the events, they played the events so everything looked good in that way but in the interviews we find out that um, there was no feeling of progress for them anymore in the game and uh, then we went back to the analytics and realized that, hey, even if we did this qualitative study of a few players, from the analytics we could quantify the problem and see that, hey, there is, there is a reasonable chunk of people who are in this situation, we must do something for this, and now they are putting out more levels. Fourth thing about the analytics. It can be used for measuring UX improvements. And this is interesting because if we can show that our work affects uh, KPIs, we are actually proving return on investment, Roy. And this is a really a holy grail of uh, user research and usability for a long time. So, yee-hoo, if we can do this. <laughs> but I, unfortunately, I have to say yes and no. There are, I will talk about it a little bit more. Because, <coughs> because the KPIs measure the whole uh, game, overall game experience and game. Uh, so if you do a one improvement here, one improvement there, it's, it rarely shows in the general game KPIs. And in live game, uh, the improvements you may be wanting to do, you, bigger things, changes you might want to do gradually, and typically there are many things going to the same build, so you might not be able to do only this improvement in the one build, but there goes something else too, or is coming up next week, so you don't know whether the, <coughs> really this improvement did it and how much of the uh, KPI improvement it really affected. And then there is these external factors with the analytics that affect. For example, uh, Battle Bay, uh, they were in a soft launch in Thailand and uh, very kind of suddenly their retention rate dropped dramatically. Nothing happened there and the game team was pulling their hair like, hey, 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 what is happening? What did we de did with this build? But the situation just continued until someone noticed that, hey, the king of Thailand had died and people were mourning and that's, this lasted for several weeks. So there's an external factor for you. So how do we, I mean, how do we get past this? What I have found really useful on the digital service side is that we get these more specific analytic events to track the points you need. For example, if there is some thing, uh, feature, purchase, um, shopping you are trying to improve, you can add more tracking event, uh, track more events there so, you, so that you can specifically measure the, this event and the sequence of things, how they happened and how long people spend in which phase. So there you have a measure and one, well, while you iterate you can improve the thing and show that there has been improvement. Um, and don't be afraid of the iterations because typically to, to improve there is a need for several iterations. Unfortunately what often happens with these iterations is that we do one user research and we do the improvement and then like the iteration ends and the game team easily starts <coughs> trying out different alternatives again by just, uh, in my mind, guesswork. So doing this A-B testing, that, hey, this could also improve it and this could also improve it without doing the user research, the why part in before that. And uh, this is something that is very useful for the F2E especially because, like you all know, it's very important for the... Uh, 
for free to play gaming. Okay. So here is a brief recap and expansion. With analytics, you get the same language, same goal with a game team. Uh, you can uh, get the indication of uh, real uh, serious problems. You get clues where to research uh, to make hypotheses. You can measure improvements and, uh, <coughs> and it's easier to motivate the game team also to do your suggestions and improvements if you can say that, hey, this should affect your retention rate and we can measure that. And uh, analytics is developing fast, and this is a field where I think like we should really jump in the wagon now instead of like waiting where it goes. Because I think we have very valuable input for there too. Maybe we can more and more combine this analytics and qualitative research. And um, all in all, since KPIs measure the success of the game, it's a real opportunity for us user researchers to make an impact. So my next, next topic is user acquisition, uh, UA, and with, um, with um, free-to-play gaming, uh, user acquisition, like you probably all know, has become very important, <coughs> and the competition is hard, and gaming companies are putting big money to here. So that is why we may be should pay attention whether we could do something or collaborate on this area. Okay, can you support UA activities? I put it as a question because I think uh, every company is doing their UI a little bit different ways. So it's worthwhile to interview your UA team about what they feel they would need or they could use. Uh, typically, UA targeting is something that the money goes a lot, and uh, the better targeting they can do, the, the less they have to pay for per user. So it's a big money issue. And uh, typically, they might be interested on the, on the current players, especially engaged players, age, gender, preferences, places they go, and um, also like how users find their game. But there's the other way around too, like how UA can help you. In Rovio, we have tested responses to the game with different target audiences <coughs> with the help of UA, and uh, we have gotten a nice set of external survey responders but with the help of them also. Uh, in the digital services world, in my startup, we did this, that we did a UA testing, meaning that we, <coughs> we did targeting to advertising to certain specific target groups, uh, looking at whether they were responding positively to our ads, uh, meaning that they would be interested in this kind of product. And then we did user research to find out more about this target group, to understand what was in this product that they were really interested in and what benefits they mostly appreciated. And then we used that to make the marketing message. So, and this is something that you can do even before the actual product has been done. Okay, my last topic is organic growth and retention. Uh, current wisdom in the digital services is that um, scalable <coughs> services should be such that once you infect a certain uh, part of the population, infect, but like uh, <laughs> you, um, they become your users, let's say in this way, uh, with the paid UI, then uh, the service should work so that it starts also getting this organic uh, growth, so that it gets users also like without the paid UI. And in that way, the services are more scalable and it's possible to get investors to them. <laughs> so, and especially th it, this relates to two learnings, uh, getting more users the organic growth part. 
Uh, so with virality, I mean here the service or games ability to gain more users with the help of current users. Uh, for digital services, this, there are two very important ways. It's a way of getting online recommendations. There are several recommendation systems that are typically supported and then uh, ability to invite new users. But what we also know from the digital services is that the product must be good for virality to work. Nobody inv invites their friend to a crabby service. So uh, when you ask people, you must ask wisely also. So they must be in the right phase of the fa funnel, of the right phase of their use of the service, so that they already know enough about the service, for example, if you want recommendations, you want them to write good recommendations, so, and instead of just, hey, I just came in and this looks nice. You want them to say, hey, this help really helped me to do X, whatever the service does. So that's why uh, getting recommendations <coughs> at the right phase of the funnel is important. And also you want it at the right situation, so you should ask uh, this Upper guy. <laughs> okay. Thank you for serving me half of the presentation. Uh, and uh, I not ask the lagger guy. So it really matters in what uh, state of mind the user is, of course, if you want a good recommendation or if you want to make them to invite people. And how does this all relate to the games user research? I think we could uh, research viral we features with users in design phase. Uh, from the digital services, we know that these uh, viral features must be, feel natural to the user and they must have motivation to do, to invite people. <coughs> so there must be some benefit from them. They don't want to just increase your business. So, for example, invitations to a worthy opponent, gi giving them some kind of reward and incentives. And uh, then there is the question of where are users' social circles? So, where could they affect could we uh, post, post um, messages somewhere? I think like, for example, Facebook has, uh, it's not anymore working very well, but is it because your target audience is not there or the target audience like, doesn't like it? So should we find new ways to, to, um, to help people, to invite more people to our <coughs> game? Like, think it a little bit differently. And uh, in, uh, in a, the, the, the third way of doing the research is the startup style, so that you just put the feature live and see how, what happens. And it's easy to calculate how many people you get, uh, how many invitations you get, and how many people you get in. For example, uh, this digital service, <coughs> for, let's say, in the start, one startup, uh, we got this variance of zero to 28 people. And of course, the people who can bring in 28 new registered users are really valuable. And uh, I think there might be a really good uh, opportunity for user research to research, like, who are these people? And what we can do to get this, more of these people to, for example, our game. Last learning is organic retention. Uh, from the digital services, we know that social features are important to keep people coming back to your service and the perceived value of the service is bigger if they, if they know somebody from there or if they have gotten to know somebody in there. And uh, it's a, nowadays in the digital services, they really, when they are designing the service, it's really difficult to think really hard how can we, what kind of social features there could be. 
and how does this translate to user research? Um, maybe we should put more priority on social features since they bring uh, more users and engagement when they are successful. And uh, we can do user research early on at the design phase to evaluate ideas even before they have been invented, uh, not invented, but uh, uh, implemented. And uh, we can do this um, exploratory use, user research. So re research on the users who, um, to find new ideas, like different social groups and roles and the social influences, influencers like uh, streamers. And uh, one thing with the social features is that they are typically rather difficult to implement as an add-on. But uh, for example, Guilds, um, Angry Birds 2 did a very good job. So after two years of being launched, they implemented Guilds and were able to improve their um, long-term retention. So the summary of all this, a lot of uh, jumping to different kind of learnings. Change is an opportunity. Analytics is a treasure box for user research. We can do problem finding, clues, uh, the power of why is still our magic. UX, we can do UX improvement measures and uh, UA matters, so collaborate. And uh, we should do early phase research to, to study features that bring organic growth and retention, like of our viral features and social features. Thank you. Wires really hate me. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the talk. It was really, really interesting to hear what your opinions were and how it works for you guys. Uh, you mentioned right at the start that you have two centralized researchers and then three user researchers on teams, but that's across 20 projects. So I was wondering how that works out kind of practically if you end up kind of uh, splitting yourselves amongst multiple projects or just kind of how you work together with the researchers on Teams? Uh, yes, so I'm a central researcher, so I can say it's a quite, quite a challenge. Before coming here, I calculated I have 13 projects, but like not all of them are game projects because we want to also improve our methods. We are currently looking at the new tools, new research partners and all this kind of stuff. But. Uh, it is a challenge, but we can prioritize. I think on, only the biggest challenge is that, that uh, we easily, like we do one research, and then it, like I said before, then we jump to another project. Just when like things start to improve in this team and with this project, and we should probably do another research for them quite soon again to be able to be more iterative, etc. Instead, the game teams easily go wild in <laughs> doing a lot of things. Hi, uh, you were mentioning uh, when looking at the KPIs, uh, doing specific tests to answer the why. Uh, for example, if you notice bad day one retention, what type of test will you then run to to find out the why? Okay, for, oh, I don't have me. <laughs> so uh, for, the question was that the D1 retention is bad, what kind of research we do? So uh, typically I look at the analytics to see hints of whether really the, then the day one, the first session or first sessions, how well they were, what, how long people spent on the first sessions. Like, is the problem really the F2E? And I would study the F2E then. And practically how we study the F2E is, is we do play this cloud, 
uh, remote playtesting. Uh, we do uh, playtesting live and interview people, uh, depending on the case. But, uh, and also, like, typically we also do this kind of our own review first, like F2E is something that we review first and then do, we want to then also find out from the users how they feel. Any more questions? Ah, perfect. Hey, thanks. Uh, so I had a question for you about social features. Uh, so. I also work in mobile space and we obviously see from the metrics social features are incredibly important, but every time we ask players about them, they basically say they don't care. So do you guys have any tips for what you do as far as trying to get feedback on social features before they exist? Yeah, so um, we do a lot of, like in the casual games, social features are just exploding. So, um, we get this that uh, people say that they don't want social features, but then we also get this that if they have been, for example, we have games who have guilds and they are, how to say, exposed to social features, then they come positive to social features. So I'm wondering whether this, um, at least for the parts of the social features, it's just that they don't have the experience yet. They are used to mobile, working on the, like playing on the mobile, these one player games, and they are not yet used to it. Then of course there is this issue of um, social features for like, you can say, inviting Facebook friends and this kind of stuff that I feel that some people just feel it, don't feel that it's, it's the way, thing that they have want to do, then it's another thing. Right. I'm going to ask a question, if I may. Uh, you're working with Angry Birds with one of the most recognizable <coughs> brands, perhaps in you know, modern video gaming. Um, have you recognized the impact of the branding on your research somehow? And are you uh, positive or negative? And are you taking any steps to mitigate it, if you, if you are? Uh, sorry, can you repeat sure. that? Sorry, end? it's my fault. Um, with Angry Birds, you're working with one of the most yeah. recognizable brands. I'm interested if you've recognized an impact on your, any of your research, your user research, and if you're taking any steps to mitigate the impact of having a recognizable brand. That's a, that's a really good question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we are definitely looking at the, at the brand, and we are, of course, utilizing it, for example, in the user acquisition. It's very <laughs> useful to have a good brand. Um, we are asking people, like, always we try to find out whether they, if we are working on a, because we now have other IP also, we are asking them whether they have played something on the Angry Birds uh, and try to understand like, does it have an impact on this? If I said it wrong, like, uh, it, it's not new IP, but let's say that if you have seen Angry Birds Evolution or something like that, the birds are totally different. So, in those cases, I think it's, that it's, the name is Angry Birds Evolution is the, is the driver for people. And of course, when we were researching, and at that time, we are asking them, like, are they playing other games of Angry Birds or were they family or before? But I think it's very important for us also to research people who are not exposed to the brand, and then we compare, like, what's the difference? Any other questions? Thank you, Mia. Thank you.